นะโมทัสสะบะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะบะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะบะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะบุตรังธรรมังสังขังนมัสสามิโอ once again very happy indeed to to, uh, uh, to be here with you all on this uh, auspicious day. Winter in uh, Queensland is very pleasant weather, <laughs> very comfortable, uh, not not too hot, not too cold. So uh, very uh, enjoyable to to meet everyone, to be seeing how Ajahn d h a m a s i h a Ajahn m o n e o have uh, helped to develop this place and uh, provide uh, an environment for for Dhamma practice for. All those who are drawing close. So I'll offer a few reflections today, and then we can open things up for some questions. The last couple of times, people have had very good questions and had good dhamma discussion together. So one of the themes that um, Lumpur s u m e t o likes to e m p h a s i z e in his teaching is he uh, would often point out how you know. When you uh, come in contact with Buddhism, then uh, uh, whether it's a Southern tradition or Northern tradition, oftentimes the, the Four Noble Truths are presented as kind of begin, beginner's Buddhism. So, chapter one, page one, you know, here are the Four Noble Truths, and then so sort of, uh, those are presented, and people can be kind of eager to get onto something more interesting. Yeah. Begins with dukkha, suffering. Oh, it's not very pleasant. <laughs> not very inspiring. Uh, that, that's the, that can we talk about uh, uh, permanent happiness? Can we talk about you know, liberation? Yeah. Uh, so uh, over and over again, I, I've been studying with Lumpur s u m e t o um, since 1979, so 45 years, and uh, over and over again, from the very beginning up till today, really, he keeps uh, pointing out that uh, the Four Noble Truths are not beginner's Buddhism. They're they're like uh, The, the the very essence of the teaching, the the real heart of the heart of the teaching. So, um, uh, getting past the four noble truths uh, is like getting past oxygen. It's like, well, no, let's not get past that. <laughs> we we need that. That that uh, that's essential for our, our life, for our, our development, and to to stay stay with reality. We need oxygen. So the uh, the Lord Buddha himself, over and over again. Uh, so, uh, emphasized this, and that uh, he was prepared for people to be uninspired or to think this is somehow you know, too simple to be that re- that important. But over and over again, he would emphasize that the, these these four simple principles. That this is <laughs> this is the 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 essence of the essence, and uh, the uh, the the symbol of the elephant's footprint. They said just as the The footprints of all the other animals that live in the forest can fit within the footprint of the elephant. So too, all other teachings fit within the the footprint, the 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 uh, say the the purview of the four noble truths. Everything is contained with, within that. So uh, I, it's, uh, I feel it's uh, even though you might hear the so visiting monks say four noble truths and you go, oh okay, switch off. This this won't be very interesting. I've heard all this before. I know this. It's like I've I've breathed before. I don't need to keep breathing. <laughs> I would say, in my my not very humble opinion, it's like I've been breathing all day. I don't need to do that anymore. It's like, well, <laughs> we might want to keep breathing if we want to stay alive. Or like the uh, the, the famous uh, incident where the Buddha was walking through a, a the forest outside of the city of k o s a m b i the s i n g s a p a forest. And he he reached down to pick up a handful of leaves, and he said, "So, what do you think? Uh, the number of leaves I have in my hand uh, uh, compared to the number of the leaves in, on, on all the trees in the forest, yeah, you know, which is greater?" And they said, "Well, the number of leaves in your hand, very uh, venerable sir, is very very small, and the number of leaves in the forest is very very great." And he said, "So, in exactly the same way, what I know." 
but I understand what the, the, the knowledge that the, that the, the Tathagata has is comparable to all the trees and the leaves on all the trees in the forest. So the Buddha said, yeah, my range of knowledge and understanding is, is vast, is enormous. But what I teach you <coughs> excuse me, is comparable to the few leaves I have in my hand. And what do I teach you? <laughs> I teach you dukkha, the experience of dissatisfaction, uh, its origin, uh, its cessation, and, and the path leading to its cessation. Why do I teach you that? Because that's what leads to peace, that's what leads to freedom, that's what leads to, to true happiness. And the other stuff, why don't, I, why don't I teach you all of that? Everything else that I know, all the kind of um, vast range of knowledge about life, the universe and everything, because most of it, 99.999%, doesn't lead to peace, doesn't lead to, to freedom, doesn't lead to happiness. Therefore, I don't teach you. So it's rather, uh, the Buddha was also known as the doctor of the world, uh, the great doctor. And so I, I often think of, of uh, the doctor being uh, like a, a, a physician rather than a theoretician. He's like a, a, a good doctor. So <clears throat> a theoretician, someone who knows the theory of health and, and life and medicine, uh, they can tell you everything that's in the medical books, but a good doctor will say, where does it hurt? <laughs> so you come to the doctor, you say, what, what's, what's wrong? Have you got a, an ache? Have you got a rash? Have you got, is something broken? Is something bleeding? Is something uh, is giving you a fever? Uh, where does it hurt? What's the problem? So this is the, the Buddha's approach with the Four Noble Truths is very much like a, a good doctor saying, where does it hurt? <laughs> you know, wh uh, how can I help? So I feel it's good to understand the, the Four Noble Truths in, in that way. And uh, if you go to a doctor and the doctor says, let me tell you about the theory of medicine, well, you're not going to get cured <laughs> by, by that, that doctor if they just give you a theory. But uh, the Lord Buddha's approach was, um, to, to point to that spiritual illness of, of dukkha, dissatisfaction, and to say, well, uh, this is the experience that we have. Now, where is this coming from? What's, what, what's this about? So uh, my, another of the teachings that, uh, so uh, again, that, that um, emphasis, emphasis on the Four Noble Truths that uh, Lumpur Sumedho has made over the years, I feel is very good to take to heart. That like He's an extremely wise person. He really knows his stuff. And he keeps saying, this is the essential teaching. So, okay, maybe, maybe I can follow that up and, and not think of this as you know, kindergarten Buddhism or chapter one, page one Buddhism. But uh, maybe this is something that applies moment by moment, day by day uh, for us. And one of the other aspects of the, the Four Noble Truths that uh, Lumpur Sumedha would emphasize is that each truth has a particular task associated with it. So in the, the Buddha's very first discourse, the turning of the, the wheel of Dhamma, the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutta, he spells this out. And so uh, for each of the, the four truths, there's something that we need to do with it to make that, to make that really uh, effective in changing our lives, changing our experience. So uh, for truth number one, the, uh, the truth of dukkha, dissatisfaction, then uh, the, the, the task associated with that is parinyayanti. So parinya means like to, to, to comprehend or to study, to, to, to not just to receive or to, uh, to understand, but to explore. Like in the Thai language, parinya is a word for a university degree. Same word, parinyayanti. It is to be studied. So most of us, when we're experiencing suffering, where we're, we're too hot, we're too cold, somebody's just been rude to us, uh, where we, we want something and we can't get it, or we've, we're stuck with something that we, we don't want, <laughs> then uh, we blame the, uh, the government, we blame our partner, we blame um, the, uh, the, the queue at the, at the restaurant, we blame the air conditioning for not working. It's like, it's something the mind blames, other things, or we take it internally and we um, we, we absorb into that. Oh, poor me! This is this is so awful. This is not fair. Yeah, and uh, this is uh, something that is yeah you know, real and burdensome and uh, and a real problem. So rather than blaming other things or blaming ourselves uh, for for that experience of dissatisfaction, that feeling of frustration or incompleteness. The, the Lord Buddha says, get interested, 
look at that feeling of dukkha. So rather than suppressing it or running away from it or blaming somebody else or just trying to go numb and distract ourselves, not feel it, he says, get interested, parinyayanti. Look at this so that that... Uh, the, with the four, four, uh, four Noble Truths. In our day-to-day -day experience, when we are on the road, we're trying to, to get to work or get to a, an appointment and we're surrounded by other vehicles on the road, we might say, I am stuck in traffic or the traffic is awful. But um, we can instead look at this and say, oh, well, here is the feeling of dukkha. Yeah, I'm not getting what I want. Uh, the... Uh, Apiehi sampayogo duko, piehi vipayogo duko. Separation from the liked, I'm not getting to my destination. Association with the disliked, there's all these other cars on the road. Yampi chang nalavati tampi dukang. As we were reciting earlier today, that not getting what you want is, is dukkha. So instead of blaming the other people on the road, uh, or just uh, feeling frustration or self-critical. Oh, I should have set out earlier. I'm so stupid. I should allow for the for you know all the traffic. We can turn the attention around and go. Oh, this is the experience of not getting what you want. Therefore, dukkha. That's the cause. This is the effect. Aha. <laughs> Very simple. This is me not getting what I want. Therefore, dukkha. Okay. Very simple formula. <laughs> and, and this this is the experience of uh, having a particular want, a desire, and not getting it. And the result is this feeling of dukkha. Oh, here's the cause, here's the effect. That's how it works. And so when we, we look at, at that the experience itself, then uh, there, there's a, a change of attitude. There's, there's a, rather than looking at that experience of suffering or dissatisfaction as a problem or something that, is, uh, that we've got to get away from or we, we shouldn't be feeling, Rather, we, there's an experience of knowing it. Oh, this is the experience of dukkha. This is, this is the feeling of not getting what I want. It's just this feeling. Oh. And so then when we start to study that, that, that feeling and get to know it, uh, again, as Lumpur would say, the Lumpur Sumedha would, would often say, there isn't, we say there is suffering, but really there isn't any, there really isn't any suffering. We just think there is. <laughs> it just feels that way. But when it's really explored, when it's really known, that feeling of, ah, I don't like this, I don't want this, that in itself, when it's really looked at and received, it's empty, it's just a feeling. It's uh, that feeling of, of uh, dissatisfaction is uh, insubstantial, it's just a, a passing impression, that's all. And also that uh, when we start to study the feeling of dukkha, we can use our capacity for wise reflection, investigation. So one, thing, one exercise I like, or suggestion I like to make to people, uh, I was bringing this up when I was in um, Buddha Bodhiwana Monastery, is isn't it interesting how they are traffic? How many people here have ever thought, I am traffic, uh, I am on the road getting in the way of all these good people, how unfortunate. Like, I, I'm not reading anybody's mind. It's just, it's like, yeah. But how many of us think that way? Oh dear, I'm clogging up the road for all these good people who've got important places to go. Yeah. I, uh, I really wish I wasn't traffic for all these people. But our ordinary way of thinking is, they are traffic, they are in my way. The traffic was awful, right? Isn't, isn't, or the traffic was really good. You know, I, I, I could get here, but... The way we customarily think is they are traffic, not, uh, not that we're uh, contributing to that. So when we explore that feeling of dukkha, then say, like, oh, my mind is saying, if these people weren't in my way, then I could get where I want to go and that would be good. And then as you spell that out and look, oh, that, because I've created that idea, of, I need to go there, these people shouldn't be in my way, therefore all these people are making me suffer. It's the, the, the problem is out there. So when we explore that feeling, then we realize, oh, it's <laughs> if there's any suffering, it's only coming from one place, uh, right here. And even if your car is, is standing still and surrounded by other cars on the road, not going anywhere, rather than thinking, oh, this is really frustrating, it's really annoying, you say, oh, I could just have a little meditation period. <laughs> we're, not, we're not moving, I can take my hands off the wheel, close my eyes have a peaceful few minutes until the things start moving again. A good opportunity for a little 
little meditation break. Why not? Rather than creating dukkha around their experience uh, uh, of that moment. So that first, the, the, the task associated with the first truth is exploration, studying that. So it takes an, an, uh, an effort and an interest to turn towards that and go, ooh, this is the feeling of dukkha. So in that the Dhammachaka Sutta, which we recite quite often, just that, that little phrase, idang dukang, <laughs> you know, this is dukkha, there is dukkha. This is the experience, idang dukang, this is dukkha. Just that turn is the beginning of making the whole difference. When we get interested in dukkha, then we uh, create the conditions where it can be transcended. So that the, uh, uh, the, one of the, another of the teachings of the, the Lord Buddha about dukkha was, he said, it ripens in two ways. One way is, as I was describing, we resent it, we fear it, we suppress it, we distract ourselves from it, we blame other people, <laughs> we, we wallow in it, we complain about it. That, and all of that just creates more dukkha. That sort of keeps us the, the, the mind fixed on the wheel of birth and death, the wheel of becoming. So one way of, of dealing with dukkha uh, is, um, is just creating more, more conditions for more dukkha. We can stay fixated and, and trapped on that, that cycle of becoming. The other way, <laughs> the other way that dukkha ripens is, uh, the Buddha said, was in search. That, that, that same kind of curios curiosity or exploration, that it ripens in search, which means, uh, and as he says in the sutta, there must be some alternative to this. There must be some way out of it. Not every being is experiencing this, so there has to be a way that the mind can relate to this experience, this event, this uh, is not creating a problem. Now, what is that way? So essentially that, that dukkha, that experience, is arousing a quality of sadha, of faith. And in one, one particular teaching, the Buddha then says that that faith, that, that sense of a, of a different track that can be followed, like, this is just a feeling, it's not absolute. Now, uh, how can this be worked with? And that faith... Sadha leads to a kind of joy, a kind of pamo, what they call pamoja or delight, a sense of, uh, of like, yeah, there, there, there is a way. There, there has to be a way forward. Okay, now uh, let, let's uh, let's follow that up, and that pamoja that leads to a relaxation of the body, kaya pasambati, the the relaxation of the body that leads towards joy and towards contentment, sukha. That the sukha leads towards and supports quality of samadhi, concentration. Samadhi leads to the development of, of insight, uh, the knowledge and vision of the way things are. That leads to, uh, to a letting go. So insight arises and there's a, a letting go, uh, a relaxation of the, of the attitude. So there's a, a coolness of heart, a disentangling, viraga and nipita, a cooling. And then that letting go, that leads to uh, the knowledge and vision of liberation, of vimuti. So right there, that <laughs> by turning towards dukkha and, and, and recognizing this can't be the whole story. There has to be an alternative. And some kind of recurrent problem that we have, some obsession, some fear, some aversion, some unrequitable desire. That, uh, the, or if you're addicted to something like smoking or alcohol or sugar or caffeine uh, you know, or, uh, or uh, 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 social affirmation or success in the business world, you know. Or if you're an academic, publishing academic papers, can, you have all kinds of addictions we can have. <laughs> that uh, just to to recognize, not everybody's obsessed with this. Not everyone has the same addiction. Not everyone is caught up. There has to be a way forward. So that turning towards the experience of dukkha, that idang dukkang, that getting interested in it, that can lead directly to the path to transcend it. So the second noble truth the, is the. Uh, the origin or the cause of that dissatisfaction. And when the, the Buddha spells it out in that teaching of the Four Noble Truths, uh, he, he pinpoints uh, tanha or craving as being the, the, uh, the, the cause or the, the origin. I would say it's the most tangible, most visible part of the process. At its root, <laughs> it's uh, ignorance or not seeing things clearly that is the, the, sort of the, the root issue, but that uh, that's, can be very, very subtle and very hard to, uh, to notice. So the, I feel that the Buddha pinpointed or, or highlighted tanha or craving 
as the cause of, of that dissatisfaction because it's the, the most visible, most tangible part of the whole process. It's where it starts to get very obvious, like, I want this, I haven't got it. <laughs> like that craving for, for sense pleasure, uh, being hungry for food or being sexually attracted to someone or, or being, uh, say, uh, burdened by something that you want to get rid of, that if only I can get rid of this, then I'd be happy. So various kinds of craving for, for sensual uh, pleasure or sensory comfort. And also the more subtle kinds of craving, craving to become something, to craving for defined being, uh, bhavatanna, bhavatanna, or its partner, vibhavatanna, the, the craving to switch off, to not feel, to, to not be. Um, that these are all various kinds of craving. So they're much more visible and tangible. The, the root of the process, uh, he, in other teachings, he names as, as ignorance, not seeing things clearly. But I would say he, in the Four Noble Truths, he highlights tanha because that's where we really feel it. Like, but I want it, but I can't get away from it. Ah, that's okay. Tanha, craving. <laughs> it's tangible. It's visible. We can. It's easy, easy to spot. So that the uh, the way of working with the the second noble truth, that like truth of craving being the cause of suffering, is uh, pahatabanti. It is to be let go of, so that. The, the mind's fixation on a particular desire object, I've got to get rid of this thing, if only I could get away from this, then I would be happy. Then to notice that craving, that, that, that grasping feeling, and to know that, to feel that, and then out of wisdom then for that to be let go of, pahatabanti, uh, to, to uh, say, uh, <coughs> draw upon that capacity to relax, to let go, to not grasp, to not, to not cling. So that's the the way of working with the second noble truth. So in the, the, the Buddha's more refined teachings about the whole process called the dependent origination, he points out that it's, it's feeling or vedana, sensation, that's what conditions craving. And that can be subtle feeling or, or, or very coarse. But that uh, when the mind is aware of feeling, it doesn't have to be deluded. It doesn't have to be caught up. It doesn't have to be creating a sense of I or me or mine around that. There can be stro there can be pleasant feelings, painful feelings, neutral feelings, and the heart can be totally at ease with that. But <laughs> if the if we're not seeing clearly, if ignorance is very strong, then what happens is that I like turns into I gotta have, I want, and I dislike means I can't stand. I gotta get away from. So I like to f to picture it as a kind of bridge. So Vedana is on the 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 kind of comfortable side, <laughs> uh, and so that we can feel and be uh, and perceive, see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and, and sense in the body, um, all kinds of sensory objects, uh, and so that the mind can be fully aware, fully awake to to the realm of, of feeling, and not pay, make a problem out of it. We can have great physical pain and not be waiting for it to be over. It's still painful, we can still do something about it, but uh, we don't have to create suffering uh, around that. Yesterday, uh, I think it was yesterday, I was giving the example of the Lord Buddha himself had chronic back pain. The beginning of the, the discourse on the Buddha's last days, the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, he says, my body is like an old cart held together with straps and strings and you know, and the, it's like an old wagon that's sort of falling to pieces and held together with makeshift repairs. Uh, and my, uh, the only way I can experience comfort is to completely absorb the mind into emptiness. So what he's saying is that while, if he was paying attention to the, his, his body and the world in an ordinary uh, way, if he was paying attention to the sense world, it hurt. <laughs> he was experiencing chronic pain. This is the Lord Buddha. And so, uh, he, but he knew how not to make a problem out of it. He didn't complain about it. He just casually mentioning, oh, <laughs> this is how it works. The only way I can feel comfort is to completely let go of the sense world. If I'm paying attention to the senses, ow, it hurts. And then also, I, I was quoting the example of how he would sometimes be giving a Dhamma talk and, uh, and uh, he would say, um, to Ananda or Sariputta, Mahakachana, you know, to one of the great elders, say he say, yeah, uh, Sariputta, the uh, <clears throat> my back is paining me, 
Um, the assembly is still awake. I'm going to lie down and stretch my back. Uh, you carry on giving a Dhamma talk to everybody. Cause, you know, so to me, that's a, a really significant teaching. And I, I keep quoting this because I, <laughs> I do feel it's very important. So the Lord Buddha, he had chronic back pain and he was ready to do something about relieving the pain, but he didn't create suffering about it along the way. So that uh, that I feel is a really good example. So when we talk about enduring suffering or investigating suffering, it doesn't mean that we don't do anything about it. We go to the doctor, <laughs> follow the, the advice of the doctor, do the exercises that we're encouraged to do. Not because um, we can't, we're not practicing properly or we, we are, are not investigating feeling appropriately, but rather as we take steps to relieve our illnesses and our difficulties, we still don't create suffering around that. And if those, those pains and, and those uh, aches and so on, if they continue, then the challenge is to continue just to not make a problem out of it. You look after your illnesses as best you can. If the pain goes away, great. If it doesn't go away, okay. <laughs> we still don't need to create a problem out of it. So I like to think of that, the second noble truth. It's like a bridge between the, the realm of feeling and the realm of craving. So uh, if we can stay on, sort of, as it were, this side of the, the, the good side of the bridge, the comfortable side of the bridge, then it's like, uh, we can like something, delicious food, or being with a, with a close friend, being in a lovely place like the Dhammagiri Monastery. You think, yes, this is really lovely. I really like this. This is enjoyable. But we don't have to think. Therefore, I've got to have a place like this. Or how can I get to? <laughs> how can I get a, 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 a kind of a permanent kuti here? So I can always come here, and I will be able to enjoy this whenever I want. Rather, today, it's a beautiful place to be. Full stop. Tomorrow, who knows? I would say even the, the, my venerable brothers have the same kind of thought. Yes, it's a beautiful place today, roof over the head for one night. Tomorrow, who knows? Then that's a very peaceful attitude. <laughs> so if we cross the bridge to, uh, into I got to have, then uh, that, uh, that it creates tension, agitation within us, or I can't stand. So I like uh, doesn't have to turn into I want or I've got to have. And I dislike doesn't have to turn into I hate or I fear or I can't stand. It's like, just as I was saying with physical pain, it's like the mind can go, ow, this really hurts. <laughs> uh, this is exactly what I didn't want to happen. Here it is, you know, a, a broken limb or, or emotional pain as well. It's, it uh, translates into the, emo pain, uh, the emotional pain world as well. So that... Uh, that's the challenge with respect to the second noble truth. Can we learn to feel, uh, feel pleasure, feel pain, feel neutral feeling without that turning into craving? And so that's the, the letting go, that's uh, the sort of the, the way of working, the task involved with the second noble truth. Uh, the, the third truth, uh, Dukkha Nirodha, uh, those of you who've read Lumpur Sumato's books or listened to his Dhamma talks, yeah, you'll probably have noticed he spends kind of more time on truth number three than most of the others because it's the most subtle. Um, and as he would say, uh, tr the third noble truth is difficult to work with. The, the task involved with it is satchikata bhanti. It is to be realized. Satcha means truth or reality. Satchikata bhanti. It is to be realized. And I felt it was so helpful that Lumpur Sumedho's teachings on, on this area from the late 80s through the 90s and up to the present. Because he would say, peace is boring. Peace is not interesting, it's really boring. So, and he'd say, you know, would you ever get a headline in the, in the sun? Or I don't know what your Australian tabloids are. I mean, Rupert Murdoch is Australian, so I'm sure you've got plenty of Murdoch-type tabloids. But uh, you wouldn't get a headline in a Rupert Murdoch tabloid that says, Buddhist monk breathed in and then breathed out again. <laughs> that wouldn't, uh, yes, Lumpur Sumedho said, that wouldn't make the headlines. But your Buddhist monk runs off with a 16-year-old girl, it's like, oh, let me see. You know. so that would sell a lot of papers, as he would say. And so that, uh, you know, the, um, the, the mind doesn't get drawn towards peacefulness. Uh, it, uh, a lot of our sensory world is very much based on our, our animal ancestry the instincts that we have from our many millions of years of evolution. 
So our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body uh, are geared towards, can I eat it? Is it going to eat me? Is it entering my territory? Can I mate with it? Uh, is it dangerous? Can I, should I draw close or should I run away? What should I do? So right back to our kind of almost sort of monocellular ancestors, the, <laughs> the kind of little plankton. Uh, it's like, can I eat it? Is it going to eat me? Am I safe? If I'm safe, switch off. Yeah. That's how we operate. So that, that so much of our sensory world, if it's moving, if it's bright, if it's loud, loud if it's mobile, pay attention. If it's quiet, if, it, if it's uh, colorless, if it's not moving, uh, if it's benign, switch off. Not interesting, not dangerous, not attractive, no need to pay attention. So the, the influence of our instincts and our senses is very strong. So, Satchikata Bhanti, need, peace needs to be realized. When dukkha stops, uh, an, an easy example is like the, uh, if you've had the air conditioning going or a refrigerator humming, the, the fridge is humming away, then the sound of the, the fridge switches off. And you go, oh, I hadn't even noticed that. And so you've just noticed the fridge has gone quiet. And it's interesting for one, two, three seconds maybe. And then it's completely insignificant. So that, or that the noise on the street, there's a lot of cars going by, and then it all goes quiet. You go, oh, it's really nice. The traffic stopped. Ah, one, two, three. Maybe four seconds, certainly not five. And then the mind gets uninterested. Again, I'm not reading anybody's mind. This is how we all function. It's like, it's interesting that the change from noise or activity or busyness to silence is interesting for about three or four seconds, then, okay, that's done its thing, no, no longer significant, switch off. So, Dukkha Niroda needs to be realized because <laughs> peace, silence, spaciousness doesn't catch our attention. Uh, the, the mind is not drawn to it. So, that takes an effort to turn towards that and go, oh, this is, the Dukkha has stopped. Oh, <laughs> there... There's peacefulness, there's spaciousness, there's clarity. And so there needs to be a, 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 an interest, that quality of, of, turn, of chanda, intra, turning towards that and noticing peacefulness. So uh, again, many of Lumpur Sumedha's teachings about noticing space, noticing silence, uh, say coming into a room, appreciating the space in a room rather than just noticing all the people. <laughs> He said, the space in the room is the most important thing. If there wasn't space here, we couldn't be in the room. <laughs> so over and over again, these simple exercises of when, when suffering stops, when the, the tension has gone out of the system, when the letting go has happened, ah, and notice that switching off and that kind of dozing and, and say, no, nope. <laughs> the, the, the dukkha has stopped, so then... Let the be really appreciated, opening the heart to the experience of space, silence, peacefulness. And then when that is, is, is actualized, when that, that third noble truth is developed, uh, then that, uh, it's no longer, peace is no longer boring, it's really satisfying. That the, the, because the, when the, the mind isn't just being influenced by the habits of the senses, then there's a, 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 an appreciation of the, the Dhamma of the present moment, the reality of the present moment. We wake up to the, the uh, Akaliko Dhamma, the Pachupana Dhamma, the here and now reality. If the mind is habituated to seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, then that's not interesting, so we switch off. But it's by drawing upon that capacity to wake up, pay attention, be, be interested, then we can, we can open the heart to the, the present reality, which is... Uh, say directly appealing and, and liberating, which we overlook. We overlook space and silence, peacefulness. We overlook the the, uh, the dhamma of the present moment because of the next thing that might be interesting, dangerous, attractive, or a problem, or or just my responsibility, <laughs> my my next thing. We we so we overlook the present because the attention is pulled towards the the future. So if we're really developed in the practice, I would say, then um, uh, the the mind can stay with that quality of wakeful awareness, and we and it does not give rise to 
ignorance at all. Let's say that the, the mind that is uh, continually awake and aware, there's vijja, then the tendency of the mind to get drawn into to to wanting and, and uh, to uh, wanting and hating and so forth is greatly reduced. That the, that quality of avijja, that awakened awareness, helps the heart to be peaceful and uh, attuned and able to appreciate the dhamma, the here and now quality of the dhamma all the time. But that's a pretty refined level of dhamma practice. <laughs> that the not never allowing ignorance to arise at all. So uh, for most of us, we're sort of coming into the picture at yeah, craving and suffering, <laughs> so, but it is possible, and that the the great Dhamma teachers would would speak of this: that the mind sustained in the quality of vijja, of wakeful awareness, not giving rise to avijja, ignorance, not seeing clearly, then the causes for that that dissatisfaction, that that dukkha, that that uh, uh, as a anguish, are not created. Um, maybe just briefly going back to the. Um, the the, the Buddha and the, and back pain. So one of the things about ending suffering and dukkha niroda, so that if we've come into this, if you've joined up with a, this Buddhist community and thinking, end of suffering, great. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning, and if you think that means never having any physical discomfort, always having everybody like you, never having any red lights, always having parking spaces available, you've come to the wrong place. <laughs> that... that uh, the 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 ending of suffering is not everybody liking you all the time, never having any illnesses, everything being convenient and comfortable. Uh, that's not what the ending of dukkha means. But rather, it's the the ending of dukkha means that the mind knows how not to make a problem out of anything, out of failure, out of success, out of praise, out of criticism out of comfort, out of discomfort, out of health, or out, out of sickness, that the, whatever circumstances are of our day-to-day, moment-to-moment experience, the mind knows how not to make a problem out of it. So that um, the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the ending of suffering doesn't mean the ending of painful feeling. <laughs> so again, if, you, if that's what you came here for, sorry, <laughs> wrong place. <laughs> That's not on, that's not on offer in in the, the Buddhist teaching or in these monasteries, and I would say any any teacher or any group or any anybody that that uh, proclaims that they can uh, make lo- life totally comfortable for you all of the time, I'd say read the small print, because <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel that anybody can genuinely offer that or provide that. Uh, but uh, life is always going to have a degree of pain and difficulty in it, but if we develop the insight into the Four Noble Truths, then this is a way that we can learn how not to make a problem out of our successes, our failures, our gains and our losses and so on. So the fourth truth is the the path and the, the task associated with the, the Fourth Noble Truth is it needs to be developed, Bhave Tabanti, the, the Eightfold Path, and, and again, I could probably talk for the rest of the week. <laughs> Or at least until I have to get on the plane on this. But um, uh, there's different ways of relating to the Eightfold Path. And I think one of the most useful uh, uh, approaches is to take, in a a way, take a step back. Rather than focusing on the details of the eight eight aspects of the Eightfold Path, to see how it's all about the decisions that we make and the attitudes that we have. I would say that it's about what we choose, how we choose to think. Uh, what we choose to believe, uh, what we choose to say, and the, what we choose, the work we choose to do, how we choose to work with, with the mind, um, and uh, so that uh, I feel that looking at the eightfold path uh, in a more general way, it's like uh, the the more that we can develop the skill of making wise choices, then <laughs> all the good stuff will develop. <laughs> if we don't learn that skill of making wise choices, if we continue to make stupid choices, then the good stuff will not happen. The, the mind, the heart will, st- will remain constricted and, and, and hindered. Well, then, re- with respect to the, the fourth noble truth and this making wise choices and living uh, and, and say how we live and the attitudes we have, one of the teachings I like to, to quote um, is, is a very rare sutta. It's, it's one of the very few places where the Buddha speaks in detail about the causes of ignorance, of not seeing clearly. And um, 
it's called the Avijja Sutta, the Ignorance Sutta. If you're interested to look it up, in the, it's in the Book of the Tens, the Numerical Discourses, Sutta number 61. I couldn't tell you what 62 is or 60, but this one I know. <laughs> so, Sutta 61, and uh, the Buddha says, so what is the cause, what is the, the, the fuel, the, 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 the power source of ignorance? What is it that makes us not see things clearly? And then he says, it's the, the five hindrances, the five nivarana, sense desire, ill will, uh, restlessness, dullness, and skeptical doubt. Five hindrances, they are the fuel source, they're the, the power source for ignorance. And they said, what is the fuel, what's the, the source of, of the five hindrances? He says, it's the unskillfulness in thought, in, in, in speech, and in action, the th- following the three unwholesome courses of, of um, of action, of thought in action, in thought, uh, unskillfulness in thought, speech, and action. So, what is the fuel source? What's the the basis for unskillfulness, uh, unwholesomeness in thought, speech, and action? He says it's a lack of sense restraint, which is a, in English is a bit of a, an unusual term uh, outside of Buddhist circles. So the um, the Pali is is um. Uh, 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 indriya sangvara, restraint of the senses. So uh, what uh, what I feel is the best way of understanding this is if we live reactively rather than responsively. So if we're if we're living reactively, if we like something, we chase after it, we want to get more of it. If we dislike something, we fight against it, we run away from it, we complain about it. This is without any kind of reflection. So that's living reactively. Living responsively is as I was kind of describing around the second truth, that, well, I like this, do I really need to have more? Would somebody else like some? <laughs> Does this have to be uh, for me? Do I have to chase after this? Uh, and then, if it's appropriate to have more, if you're still hungry and um, there's plenty to go around, okay, well, uh, there's, I'm the last one in the queue, there's plenty of these, okay, I'll take two of them. I'm still hungry. I'm just, uh, again, just making that up. I wasn't, we don't have cameras on the food tables. So. <laughs> So that uh, living or, or re- living reactively in terms, of you dislike something, you you insult someone, you complain about something, you you contend against it. So if we're responsive, then oh, this is disliking. Oh, I'd take a mouthful of something. Oh, this doesn't taste the way I thought it was going to taste. Okay. <laughs> so uh, this is disliking. I don't have to spit it out or hate it. I think, okay, I can just be surprised that this has a taste I wasn't expecting. Okay, but um, it's in my bowl, I've, uh, and I've taken it. So uh, maybe I should just, maybe I should just finish it off, even though it doesn't taste the way I thought it was going to taste. So that uh, that space around our feelings of like and dislike is what I mean by responsivity. Just because you dislike someone doesn't mean you have to insult them or be rude about them. It means you you say, okay, well I don't like that person. They're not easy to work with, but can I? Uh, do I have to? To hate them? Do I have to fear them? Do I have to complain about them? No, <laughs> I can find a way to be polite, to be uh, at ease. So, the uh, uh, then the Buddha says. So, what is the fuel? What is the support for uh, uh, for living reactively rather than responsively? And he says it's a lack of mindfulness and full awareness, sati sampajanya. What is the fuel? What is the source? Uh, the support for uh, a lack of Mindfulness and full, and full awareness. He says it's a lack of wise reflection. What's the source of a, uh, and the fuel for a lack of wise reflection? It's a a um, uh, a uh, <coughs> uh, a lack of faith, a lack of sadha. Uh, what is the source? What's the cause for a lack of faith? Not hearing the good teachings. What's the fuel? What's the source for for not hearing the good teachings? Not drawing close to good people. Sat puri sat sang seva. So then he said, just like the rain falls onto the hilltops, forms into little puddles, the puddles form into little streams, the streams form into bigger pools, the pools feed the bigger streams, the streams feed the rivers, the rivers feed the ocean. So the ocean is filled up by water in this way. So ignorance is filled up in this way, this causal chain. Um, So by not drawing close to good people. But, (laughs) as he often does in his very thorough way, but if you draw close to good people, Sapurisa Sangseva, then that is the fuel that supports, that's the support for hearing good teachings. Uh, 
if you hear good teachings, this gives rise to to faith. If uh, if if faith is supported, that then is the fuel that's the support for wise reflection. If there's wise reflection, that's the fuel that's the the support uh, for uh, uh, restraint uh, for restraint in the senses, for living responsively rather than reactively. If you live responsively, that's the support for wholesomeness in thought, in action. And indeed, if you live with uh, with support for the in, in uh, for if you feed wholesomeness in thought, uh, speech, and action, then that is a direct support for the four foundations of mindfulness. The four foundations of mindfulness then support the the seven factors of enlightenment. The seven factors of enlightenment are the support for the the knowledge and vision of liberation, uh, vimuti jnana dasana. So that just as the, the ocean is, uh, just as the rain falls on the mountains and forms the little puddles and the streams and the big rivers and then the ocean is filled up, so too the knowledge and vision is li- of, of liberation is filled up uh, in this way and the root is sapurisa sangseva, drawing close to good people. So in terms of the development of the Eightfold Path and that sort of fourth truth, I would say what you're all doing here, gathering together for a Sunday, Spending your beautiful Sunday afternoon uh, gathering together with like-minded, good-hearted people to keep the precepts, to uh, listen to the teachings, to practice meditation, uh, to to cultivate dana and sila uh, and the bhavana. Uh, this is an extremely skillful way of spending your time. And then also drawing together, getting to meet each other, supporting each other. This is the way that uh, ignorance is deprived of its fuel and, and liberation is provided with uh, fuel and support um, in the most uh, complete and perfect way. So, Sadhu Anamodana, for all of you gathering together, spending your time like this on your Sundays, and I offer these thoughts for consideration. And uh, people have any questions or uh, some things to discuss, then please feel most welcome. Andamayang dhammakataya sadhu karang dadamase Sadhu, 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 anumodami. So there's plenty of uh, people here today, so if there are any questions or thoughts, uh, anything that would need clarifying, uh, please feel most welcome to, to ask your questions. Well, it's a very lovely place to be. So, <laughs> so no, it's very, very delightful and extraordinarily quiet for being so close to a big city. Amazingly, this uh, yesterday, uh, we were, um, yes, <laughs> we were, you know, we had a little tour of the monastery, climbing up, up to the top of the hill, and uh, ex- uh, amazing quality of. Of uh, silence, you just the bird song from around the uh, around the forest, and almost nothing else. So uh, that's uh, rare in the world, it's p- particularly close to a big city. So that um, that's very precious. But any place, it's not the geography that makes a difference; it's the people. So that you can go to the most beautiful, perfect, serene place, and you've still got your mind. Uh, that uh, that the that's the thing that matters. It's not uh, also you can be in the midst of of um, busy activity in the in the heart of the city, and it can be um, uh, not uh, uh, not a particularly supportive environment. The, the, the lack of what they call sapaya, but still your mind can be totally at peace with it. It's in the middle of. Traffic that's not moving that you're contributing to, <laughs> you can be totally at peace. So that uh, the uh, the Buddha said, you know, that Tathagatas delight in empty places. Yes, <laughs> the, the the mind that rejoices in peace and liberation, uh, such environments as a forest like this is is very very pleasant, very conducive. But the the crucial thing is is the mind. 
So it's what your mind brings to it, so that you can have a beautiful place and then two people who are very closely associated can be filled with fighting with each other about it. Experience teaches, <laughs> so that the, you know, the, the place just becomes an insignificant backdrop to this argument with the other person who has got wrong ideas about the place because they think differently than the way I do. So that it's, uh, it's amazing how a, a whole landscape can be filled up just with, with the, the tension between two people or the, uh, the kind of attachment between, between people. So the geography is very much secondary to the mind, I would say. Yes. Uh, well, the 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 um, general advice that uh, Lumpo Cha would give, I've, I've used for years and years, and I feel it's very helpful, is to, um, when the body's experiencing discomfort, to not try and change the posture and move away from it immediately, but at least for a few minutes to bring attention to the feeling and to, to see if uh, the mind can relax with that, relax the body, relax the attitude, and so that um, you're not creating more suffering around that painful feeling. To see if to take that as an exercise, his his rule of thumb would be if if you're experiencing painful feeling and uh, your attention uh, keeps going to that, like if you're trying to focus on the breath but your mind keeps going to your pain in your leg, after two or three times of going to your leg, okay, well forget the breath, just make the the painful feeling the object rather than a thing that's getting in the way of the practice, you make it what you're practicing with. So you kind of rather, you change the attitude towards it. So that's what you're learning from at that, at that point. And to, to relax the muscles around that area as much as possible, and to relax the attitude. And to see if, if even for a moment there can be that kind of recognition of it's painful, it, I feel it's, it's felt, ow, but it's not a problem. And so that, uh, what, I, what I like to encourage that, uh, I don't know if Lumpo Cha spelt it out in the same way, is that uh, what I, I like to encourage is that bringing the attention to, to the, the, the painful feeling, you relax the muscles around it, you relax the attitude towards it. And then if you have that, say, res, a, a more responsive relationship to the, of the mind to the pain, then, that that responsivity there's a, there's an a, there's an intuition that goes with that about what the limits of the body are, so that you might think okay well this is painful feeling, um, therefore I should just stay with this and not move, and endure this because uh, you know, I should, but I would say that if uh, if there's a, a spacious relaxed attitude towards painful feeling then the, your, intu your intuitive sense of the body's limits is much clearer. And so, uh, just like when you're eating, you can, if you pay attention, you can know, okay, that's enough. Time to, you know, I have enough food for the day, time to put the spoon down and, and leave it. You, your body has its own intelligence, I would say. And so with physical pain, the, if there's a spacious attitude towards that, then there comes a certain moment where, where there's the recognition Okay, that's a, that joint has been strained enough um, and uh, time to, to change the posture. And so then it's quite okay to change the posture, but to, uh, to uh, do it in this way, you're changing the posture out of kindness to, for, the, uh, for the body rather than aversion towards the, uh, the painful feeling and fear of what it might turn into. So the intention behind moving is kindness and and attunement to the body rather than fear and aversion to the to the painful feeling so the intention matches the result <laughs> so if we've moved in a restless way out of fear of pain and aversion to the painful feeling then we might have comfort for a moment but as soon as another painful feeling arises then we find ourselves tense and reactive oh no another one ah i thought i was getting away from this and it's come back again ah so we're feeding a reactive and tense attitude. 
if we're patient and 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 have a more of a responsive attitude towards the feeling, then that recognition of okay, that's enough. Uh, you know, pressure on that that joint, then letting the body change its posture. Uh, then the intention is peaceful. It's in tune with the the physical nature of things, and so the result is peacefulness and more clarity rather than more agitation and and uh, uh, kind of reactivity. Well, that's my advice. So. Yes. Including well, the uh, the um, the the dukkha that um, the in the in the morning chanting that we did, there's there's three different kinds of dukkha are uh, 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 kind of named in a way. You have dukkha dukkha, physical pain, birth is dukkha, aging is dukkha, death is dukkha. So that's dukkha dukkha, like physical discomfort is dukkha dukkha. Then you have what's called viparinama dukkha, dukkha based on the on on the experience of change. So uh, being separated from what you like is dukkha, uh, being with what you dislike is dukkha. So those things are in a state of change. And so that, um, that uh, is a second level of dukkha, and then panchupadana kandha dukkha is uh, what they call sankhara dukkha, or just the, the unsatisfactoriness of any conditioned thing. So the, um, uh, I would say for, uh, for the enlightened mind, uh, the, the mind is not creating the causes. It can't create the causes for the dukkha. It's still going to be physical pain, like uh, uh, the Lord Buddha's back pain. So that, that kind of dukkha is still going to be there, but um, the, uh, the the dukkha that comes from craving is not going to be there, and so that the uh, or the the dukkha that uh, that comes from the mind believe, buying into the world of things, the sankhara dukkha, yeah, that the mind is not uh, seeing the sankharas as substantial or solid, They're seeing the empty nature of of all conditioned things. So that that is not being, that the dukkha is not being created out of that. So the uh, the another of the teaching that's very helpful with respect to pain, to pain is called the teaching of the arrow, the Salla Sutta. Many, it's a very short teaching, but um, it's very well known. People who are in pain management, <laughs> mindfulness teachers, and people in in uh, dealing with with uh, in the medical world with uh, pain management. So the, the teaching of the arrow is based on a, the, the, an image of, a, of a, um, a soldier on a battlefield. And the Buddha says, Im- imagine a soldier on a battlefield and they're shot with, a, with an arrow, a dart, a salla. And so, so no one can avoid that first arrow, the, the arrow of physical pain. If you, have, if you have a body and you have a mind, there will be pain. So nobody can avoid that, even the Buddha himself, as I was saying, can't, that first arrow can't be avoided. The second arrow is all of the resenting, negotiating, fretting, uh, agitation around that painful feeling. The second arrow is completely avoidable. So when we talk about dukkha nirodha, it's all about the second arrow, not the first. As I was kind of saying that in the little Dhamma teaching. So that uh, the, uh, the, the enlightened ones would experience the first arrow, but not the second one. <laughs> Yes. Where and how we can, where and how the samadhi meditation or the focus meditation fit into the process uh, process of arjuna. Like if you do more concentration meditation, Mm -hmm. do you think we will be more aware of our five hindrances? Or like sometimes I am confused why we are doing samadhi or focus meditation rather can we do insight meditation because I'm more towards concentration meditation or samadhi meditation but I feel like 
it's hard for me. I'm doing it, but I'm not sure whether I'm getting any outcome from that. So, but I can identify, and, and I can I can feel and I can see when I'm getting any five hindrance, karma, chanda, virapad, anything. If it comes, I can see it coming. So confused. Where can where can I take the samadhi meditation in that process? Well, the, uh, I think the um, uh, the key thing uh, I feel is that different things suit different people. We have different characters, just like we have different shoe sizes or different uh, uh, prescriptions for our glasses, or you know, that uh, we have different characters, different dispositions. So certain practices suit or, or are, are more uh, of a better fit for some people than others. So you have um, the uh, di- within the teachings they talk about different tracks like uh, Panyavimuti, liberation through wisdom, or, or um, Chetovimuti, liberation through mind training, and that um, th- th- these are spoken about in different ways. But um, so the Chetovimuti, uh, and I can be corrected by my my brother monks, uh, if I'm getting this wrong, is is more to do with samadhi training and the development of, of deep concentration. The Panya Vimuti is, is more fed and developed through through the Vipassana meditation, insight practice. They, they, I would say they all work together. They're all re- very closely related. And the, the whole package is very useful. <laughs> but we're going to have different dispositions for different people. So the Ajahn Chah, even though he was very gifted at concentration practice, his style was much more the Panyavimuti approach. Um, and that using the reflective capacity of the mind and the ability to explore, to see how things fit together and to um, develop that, the wisdom faculty. And so that, um, uh, that you know, trying things out and seeing what, what works most easily, most effectively for us and seeing what has the the best results uh, is some, uh, something I recommend most of the time. That is, and rather than dutifully following some instructions because it's supposed to be good or it's supposed to be the right thing because it's in the book or a teacher said so, I would see what I would I would encourage the attitude of well, let's try this and see what the result is. And so that um, if you have a disposition more towards the panyavimuti, your mind is very reflective, and uh, and likes to to explore and investigate then um uh, put that to work make that make that work for you rather than think of that as a hindrance and if the mind has difficulty staying on a single object then it's going to be a, probably a good exercise to to develop that to a certain degree but if it's uh if it, it, that's not a, an easy fit then uh, it, probably best not to, to make that an emphasis like if you're tone deaf just spending you know a thousand ten thousand hours trying to learn the violin and you really can't hear the the difference between the tones more you know another thousand hours is not going to really help another ten thousand hours isn't going to help because of the, the lack of the musical ear so that uh, um and the, often it's said that the that the for Westerners, many of us find the uh, strong states of concentration less um, uh, accessible, and that the insight meditation far more beneficial, far more, far more productive. Um, and so that rather than thinking that oh I can't get anywhere until I've I've got this uh, up to so fourth jhana is totally unshakably established, um, that. Uh, it, rather than taking that as a, a fixed belief, that well, uh, okay, there's there's a certain amount of concentration is accessible, but more is is not. So that's you know, work with what what's available, what's accessible, and uh, and develop the faculty of insight, the the wisdom faculty, more so directly and acutely. You you know, put your thinking mind and your ability to recognize patterns, put that to work, make that uh, let that support the practice rather than think, than assuming that's a, an obstacle or a problem. So that, uh, uh, and I have heard, I didn't hear Lumpur Chah say this himself, but I heard him quoted as saying that, saying that the, uh, and this is, uh, I'm pretty sure this is commentarial, they say that 
the way of Moggallana was the way of, of um, concentration and psychic power. Uh, and the way of Sariputta was also, he was very adept at meditation, but Sariputta had no psychic powers at all. Uh, but he was extremely def uh, adept at meditation, but uh, his mind was very, very analytical. So the number of Dhamma talks given by Mahamogalana in the, in the Sutta Pitaka is very, very small. <laughs> number of suttas by Sariputta is quite large. So they were very close friends, but uh, the, the way of, of Mogalana is, the, is known as wet enlightenment with psychic powers. The way of Sariputta is known as dry enlightenment without psychic powers. So Mogalana was enlightened in a week. Sariputta took two weeks after... <laughs> So that uh, so I had heard that um, Lumpur Cha is saying his way was the way of Sariputta. Again, I didn't hear that directly, but I heard that quoted. That uh, and he never emphasised psychic powers or uh, uh, made a, made a big thing of that. Uh, but what he did emphasise was wise reflection and uh, using the capacity to to investigate. And if you read his teachings or listen to listen to his teachings, uh, then. Uh, over and over again, there's this uh, the kind of description of him saying, "Hey, why do I do that?" Or, "Yeah, that, look look at the way that works." Or, "This is connected to that." So his mind was very active in exploring how things worked, and his brilliance, his kind of genius with giving analogies and similes, um, is very much a part of that. Seeing, oh, this the way that you know the way of peeling a mango is just like uh, meditation practice, or or like. Uh, the, the many hundreds and hundreds of examples of you know of how you grow a how you grow a tree and how you don't grow grow a tree or how you uh, you tame a water buffalo how you don't tame a water buffalo so his mind was v very observant he saw how things worked in nature and could immediately apply that to mind training so that shows that that kind of very much that analytical uh, and um, a kind of exploratory uh, approach. So, but uh, even though Ajahn Chah, uh, it seems, did have a number of psychic abilities, he he didn't make anything of it and, and didn't recommend that in a, in for anybody to develop, and um, uh, certainly didn't emphasize that in his teaching at all. That uh, so that that um, the the kind of Panyavimuti, Chetovimuti um, tracks that were that they seem to have been, he very much. Uh, emphasize the Panya Vimuti. It's also, people have said, it's probably why he has so many Western disciples, because we, we mostly like to think a lot <laughs> and don't have such immediate abilities. I used to feel really jealous of the, the villagers in the, in, the, in, the little, in the monastery in Thailand. All us sort of busy Westerners always trying to figure, figuring everything out. And the, the, the villagers who had mostly had very little education at all they could just sit there for hours in a very good samadhi, just totally upright, totally clear, like from sort of eight, nine in the evening to two in the morning. You know, there's the a really good, really good samadhi, and not just not just sitting there, but you know, really high quality of samadhi. Uh, one of the, the the guys who was most adept, who was up after your time, poor poor prom, he was a. Uh, had been a, a drunk. Uh, he was a very gifted more lumps, a kind of folk singer, and had spent his life going around all the kind of folk festivals. And so he had quite a shake in his hands. But his meditation was extremely profound. He had a really good concentration. He, he, I think he stopped shaking when he was sitting. But he, but, uh, he had great faith in, in uh, Lumpur Cha and was, was always there to help with the arms round. But his, his career had been as a singer, like a folk, professional folk singer. There's this kind of competitive folk singing. Like a, it's like a kind of rap battle in traditional Lao um, uh, country tradition where you have like two singers up on the stage and you, you have to make up a verse spontaneously and you try to end your last line with a really difficult word to rhyme with. And then the, the other person has to pick up the line and make a rhyme with what you've... So, uh, like, just like a rap battle there. And so he was a, he was a more lum singer and had, so had drunk, spent a lot of drunken nights, but had given up drinking. And, uh, and he was a brilliant meditator. 
it was really, really a company. You know, when he was sort of come and ask the Ajahn sort of questions about his practice, you know, the the uh, the, uh, the the Western monk who was the the Ajahn when I was there, yeah, he would feel like, wow, I think I'm out of my depth here, because <laughs> this this uh, the village, the guy in the village, his his concentration was like way beyond what the the Ajahn was. Uh, apparently, seemingly capable of himself, and like, wow! I don't know if I can. I think you better go to talk, talk to Lumpo Cha. You know, this is. I'm out of my depth here. I can't answer your question. So uh, I did feel a bit jealous of like, wow, they such, such good concentration. I wish I didn't think so much. <laughs> but then you know, it, it's uh, you can't. It's like saying, I wish, uh, I wish I was somebody else, and then everything will be fine. It's like, well, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Just. To instead of wishing you were somebody else uh, and thinking that would solve all the all the difficulties, just learn to work with what what you've got with how you are. So if you can't hide it, make a feature of it, as they say in the building trade. <laughs> so I see we've got to one o'clock. Shall we? Oh, one more. Okay, one more. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. <coughs> the um, desire gets a bad rap, as they say, because uh, there's two um, specific words that are translated into English as desire. So tanha is almost invariably uh, the, uh, a, a troublemaker. There's a, I, I only know of one place in the whole Pali canon where the word tanha is used to refer to a wholesome kind of desire. All the other kind of thousands of other references it's it's a uh, it's the cause of dukkha and it's un unwholesome so the other word is chanda chanda c-h-a-n-d-a -A, chanda so that can mean interest enthusiasm zeal uh, or desire so it's a directionality so that's actually a a, a necessary condition for liberation that without chanda you know it's, it's impossible to really train the mind or live in a skillful way or do anything beneficial so that's a, a a necessary condition so one is is the cause of suffering the other one is uh, is essential for the the way out of suffering so the a wholesome desire would be uh, chanda so i would say it's not just sort of uh, the aspect of being fixated on a particular goal but also the uh, the element of i and me and mine so that if uh, if uh, chanda, if that sense of interest or enthusiasm is being actualized, but uh, um, as uh, if it's got uh, feelings of you know I want, I should, I must, uh, I gotta, then even if there's not a specific goal in mind, the more there's the that habits of self view woven into it, then it'll have a painful result. Uh, if it's free of self view. Uh, then, uh, then that chanda is uh, really v incredibly useful. It's like the motivation and, and uh, say, enthusiasm, the the appeal of reality, the the the, uh, the love of, of truth, of reality, and the motivation to to, to do something to, to change your life, to, to change the um, attitude. So that's you know extremely ben useful, beneficial. And so I would say at the at the root, it's the I, me, mine feeling, uh, if that's not present, then that, that kind of desire can generally be trusted. If it is, if it is there, then watch out. 